Well, welcome everyone and uh, good to have you all with us. As you're joining, it would be really helpful, first of all, if you could remain muted and then if you could turn off your video. And the reason that we ask you to do that is just that it helps with bandwidth for everyone else because uh, we like to hear Gethin's normal voice rather than a distorted voice when the bandwidth plays up. So uh, great, I really appreciate uh, everyone joining us. Just in case you haven't done it yet, what you, what you might want to do is to move your mouse to the bottom and open what looks like a um, speech bubble because we're gonna be using the chat box for any of your questions as we go along. So um, just to introduce Gethin, I know uh, Twitter can bring us some many bad things in life, but Twitter can also bring us some good things. And Gethin is one of those good things that we met via Twitter uh, and friends. So it's, it's really good to, to have uh, Gethin with us. He is an author and a podcaster and works for Benefix. And Gethin, I'm sure you'll tell us a little bit more about yourself, but I'm really looking forward to uh, today. Gethin, over to you. Any questions as we go along, please use the chat box. Gethin, over to you. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, and yeah, we did meet by Twitter, which is... Uh... An interesting way to meet people nowadays, but I guess uh, probably fairly normal. Uh, it's a little bit like internet dating, I think Twitter is sometimes. You kind of find some like-minded individuals um, and get on well with them. Um, so good afternoon or good afternoon, good morning, wherever it is, whatever time of the day it is, wherever you are in the world. Uh, lots of people have joined us from all over the world, so really appreciate it. Um, before we kind of get into uh, the crux of what I was talking about, um, first of all, thank you to Herman Miller and Herman Miller Insight Group and Mark for, for having me. Um, it's interesting for me to do a webinar with this kind of audience. Lots of my audiences are generally HR people. And so I appreciate there's lots of kind of workplace design and product design people uh, on this webinar. So it'd be really interesting to get your perspective on kind of what's happening with everything to do with people in organizations uh, around the world. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about um, something called community well-being. Um, as the future of the physical workplace remains pretty uncertain, uh, an area of well-being that's starting to emerge is something much more important to us and our employers, probably more so than we probably realised, is it's starting to come into play. As I go through the talk today, our Clever Marketing team have put some quotes from a conversation that they had with me into these little screens. So as you see these as you go along, if you want to take a picture of those, if you agree with it and tweet it or put it on LinkedIn, you can find me at World of Good Book or just search for Gethin Aiden or Hello Benefix at Hello Benefix uh, and we'll retweet those as well. Um, so I guess before I started, I just wanted to kind of really say that I don't think well-being at work is, is a trend. Um, I think it's fundamentally going to change how we design employee experiences with the health and happiness of employees at its core. Um, and I think as soon as the global economies recover um, from the pandemic that we're going through at the moment, I think employees are going to go back to working for employers that care for them. Uh, and when those employees don't care for them, I think they'll start to vote with their feet, like we saw before the virus hit. Uh, coronavirus has given us a renewed appreciation for what is important in our life and our health and the people around us are definitely coming out as two things that people find more important than perhaps they did before. Before lockdown, 86% of CEOs said the best talent they needed were already working somewhere else. Employers who want the best people um, have to get back to not only attracting those people, but actively attracting them away from a job that they might already love. And employees know life can be difficult and they want to work for an employer that takes care of them when the going gets tough. Mental health, cancer, stress caused by money worries, all these kind of things mean that employees face real risks to their well-being and their lives. And so they want a job that's going to help them when they need it. But we also have lots of vast and compelling evidence that an investment in employee well-being is money well spent. Thriving employees have around 53% lower days off work due to ill health. The estimated cost of poor well-being in just in this country, in the UK, is costing employers between 42 and 45 billion pounds every year. That's made up of absence rates, presenteeism, turnover costs. And it's now that agreed that generally for every kind of pound, euro, dollar invested in employee well-being, employers can see a re return of about five. So that's quite a significant investment for employers to be making. 
And so just before we get into the, the, the crux of what we're going to be talking about today, um, a little bit about me. Uh, thanks already for the introduction that you gave me, Mark. I appreciate that. Um, I've been working in the HR tech space for about two decades across employee benefits, well-being, engagement, and employee experience. Uh, a few years ago, I wrote a book called A World of Good, Lessons from Around the World in Improving the Employee Experience, which went on to the Amazon HR bestseller list in the UK in its first week and has gone on to sell loads of copies in kind of uh, countries all over the world and has even won an award. But it was my research for this book that made me realize just how significant well-being is to a great experience of work and why I think two years after writing that book, this isn't another fad, it's not gonna go away. It's gonna become a really important part of what work is gonna be like for everybody. And so community wellbeing and how a pandemic has changed this. The idea behind community wellbeing is that our subjective wellbeing, which psychologists will tell you is happiness, isn't just about our personal experience. It's actually affected by the people that are around us, the people that are in our lives. Um, and most employees will spend most of their working lives at work or in the workplace. And so that's why our work relationships and being part of a community have become so important to our well-being. The people we work with can have a significant impact on us. And as many areas of well-being are, are very uh, interdependent, it can affect almost every part of our well-being. So when employee well-being is low, it affects our work, it affects absence rates, but it also starts to affect the people around us. So the community starts to suffer um, when its members have poor well-being as well. And so I've been talking about community well-being for a while. Um, we changed one of our pillars at Benefex to community well-being in December last year. And then all of a sudden, what we saw almost right across the world four or five months ago is that through lockdown, we've started to realize that actually community well-being is really, really important. Our health has depended on the health of those people that are around us, you know, to keep each other safe we've had to be really mindful of other people in our communities. And so I think this area of well-being almost overnight has become incredibly important to the workplace. And what we mean by community well-being, um, the social interactions that we have in those communities play an essential role in our well-being, which in turn has a really positive impact on employee engagement. So research shows us that organizations with really high levels of employee engagement show lower business costs, improved performance, lower staff turnover and lower absenteeism, and they even have fewer safety incidents. And we could also see that employees who are satisfied with the overall quality of their workplace relationships are even more likely to be loyal and feel more attached and feel like they belong to the organization. So in the context of community wellbeing, this is, isn't just about people, but it's about how those people around us make us feel. So are we represented within the community as an individual? Do we feel secure in our teams? Do we feel like we can bring our whole selves to work? Is our voice heard? Um, how does our work in the work community impact the wider community that we live and work in? So are the things that we do in the workplace that actually enhance the community? And some really big global brands like Patagonia and Ben & Jerry's have started to realize that actually, if they want to attract the right employees and if they want to attract the right consumers, then you've really got to start thinking about how am I impacting the community? How am I giving back to the community? So that work community plays a big part in the external community around work as well. And so while lots of those different areas of community well-being were important before, as I mentioned, we've kind of seen this pretty seismic shift in recent months uh, as employees have adjusted to lives full of more tech and with less connection to each other over the last couple of months. And I think what that's really done is drove us into what experts are calling a social recession. Um, a Harvard study of adult development tracked the lives of about 1,000 men for 80 years or so, and researchers hoped to discover the secrets of a successful, happy, and good life. And the study found that relationships tremendously impact our health, happiness, and the quality of our lives. And it was also found that the quality of relationships mattered more than quantity. But we're in this social recession. We are losing the connection with people that our evolution has deemed so important to our survival. And around the world, what we started to see is a growing loneliness problem. In 2019, more than half of UK employees said they felt lonely always or often, and around half of employees globally say they don't have a friend at work. In the 2008 Australian Loneliness Report, more than one quarter of survey participants said that they felt lonely three or more days a week. Across the whole of the EU, around 30 million adults frequently say they feel lonely. While in places like Japan, an estimated half a million people shut themselves off from society, often staying in houses for months on end. 
And you look at countries like Japan, where it's becoming increasingly difficult for young people to find a partner and to get married. The number of single people in places like Japan is kind of going through the roof because the the technology dominated lives and their work dominated lives mean that they don't have the time to go out and build these connections with people. Uh, in a report in 1998, a psychologist from suggested that when we experience social pain in the workplace from feeling isolated, for instance, the region of the brain which is activated is the same as if we get physical pain. So we're starting to see that actually that loneliness, that disconnect from other people is really significantly harming the people that are feeling loneliest because of what's going on. And this was all happening way before coronavirus was a word that any of us were familiar with. So what we've started to see over the last four or five months is that issue compounded um, quite significantly. Um, one of probably my favorite films of all time um, is one of Charlie Chaplin's first spoken films, uh, and it was also his most expensive. Uh, and that's a film called The Great Dictator. Uh, it's a comedy, but it's got a really kind of poignant ending to it. And there's a really famous scene which people like Paolo Nutini, the singer, has used in one of his songs, and it's pretty well known. And it was a rousing speech that Charlie Chaplin gave us to remind us of the importance our connection to other people was. Uh, and I'm going to read the quote just from um, that, uh, that um, film. So Charlie Chaplin says, we have developed speed, but we've shut ourselves in. Machinery that gives abundance has left us in want. Our knowledge has made us cynical, our cleverness hard and unkind. We think too much and we feel too little. More than machinery, we need humanity. More than cleverness, we need kindness and greatness. And I use that quote a lot. And I quote it in my book as well. I quote this film in my book as well. It's because I think decades later, we're still trying to replace human connection with technology and distance, and it isn't working that well. And I think we just need uh, an absolutely better balance. And while loneliness is being compounded by lockdown and the pandemic, our sense of community has actually started to increase. So we've actually realized that we need other people in our lives. Um, as we've been forced away from our colleagues and family, many of us have turned to neighbors, which we never spoke to before for social support. And we've had this really nice boom in a sense of community that many of us felt whilst we've been dealing with the pandemic. Um, and that gives us some pretty compelling evidence that actually as humans and as employees, we're all striving for quite a lot more connection than we've had before. And I think when I was talking to one, one of our guys internally about this, kind of, I felt like that virus has become a pretty good excuse for us to think about what an office is and why do we want them? And how can we build better workplaces that are designed around happiness and well-being? Um, this forced experiment that this pandemic has been is drastically changed the way we live and work. And it's given us the opportunity to rethink how we can build our workplaces to cater for better mental health to cater for better social connection and enhanced community. So could we rebuild offices so that they solve some of the problems around loneliness and isolation that employees have been feeling for, for so long? And so I think we've got to the point that, you know, all of this matters because if we are lonely, if we don't feel connected at work, if we don't have friends or positive relationships, our workplaces, I think, are doomed. Uh, and I think while technology is helping us maintain positive relationships, it's not helping us create them in the same way that face-to-face -face does. So we have to balance the new desire to work from home with the need to have an office. And I think these two lives aren't mutually exclusive. I think they need each other to survive. Um, so as the world locked down, we started to see those kind of really high profile global employers really quick to adapt to working from home uh, with results that surprised everybody. So we saw in the news that Twitter announced all staff could work from home forever. Um, lots of major banks around the world started to think about alternatives to the office because this forced experiment uh, proved at least temporarily that you could run a bank from home. So that one of the major banks, Barclays, one of the world's largest banks, made about 70,000 people work from home. They, they ran a bank from home almost overnight. Um, and as a result of some of these really large experiments, some research suggests that around 20% of those that used to work in a physical office may never ever go back to it and will continue to work from home permanently. But as I was reading all this research, and as we started to hear, see all the headline news that these major employers, um, Barclays, UBS, Morgan Stanley, etc., were saying, right, this is it, it's changed our workplace, we're going to start working from home en masse for quite a long time. I started to think about the research I did for my book or the research I've read years ago, and it made me think that actually 
is this really a new idea? Is this working from home that felt like this new thing that we were forcing on people? Was it that new? Because if we look at pre-COVID-19 research, we can start to see that this was actually a pretty growing trend in large portions of the workforce who were already working from home. I've been working from home for 20 years. And so we realized that practically we could work from home, but does that mean that it's actually changed things that much? Um, last year it reported, you know, hundreds of US employees reported that a third of their workforce were already working from home some of the time. And another report found that 66% of US employees were allowed to work from home if they wanted to. But what we found is employees weren't prepared to work from home in the long term. They weren't set up for it. It's unlikely that they had been given the right tools to do that. Um, and so when we think about a long, long term successful go at making uh, working from home work, we need people to really think about the space and their living conditions. And for those employees under the age of 25, they're probably more likely to be living with their parents and not have any space to work from home. But there are quite a few other problems that full-time work from home brings to us. Um, there's a great book called Back to Human, How Great Leaders of Create, oh, sorry, How Great Leaders Create Connection in the Age of Isolation uh, by a gentleman called Dan Schwabel. Um, and he found that employees spend half their day using technology to communicate rather than rely on face-to-face -face or even telephone conversations. And he felt that actually during the pandemic, as a result of that, slightly more than half have said that often they feel lonely. Um, and so this is pretty bad news for business because employees working from home a lot struggle with loneliness. And if somebody who's done that for, two, uh, for 10 years or so, I can tell you that's a real thing. You do feel really disconnected from the organization. And I only feel connected when I go into the office. And some of you might know a gentleman called Perry Timms, uh, a fellow friend and author of mine in the HR space. And he put something a couple of days ago, just on Twitter, just kind of actually asking, what do people think the office of the future is gonna look like? Will we work remotely from home? Um, and what he started to find is, you know, 57% of the people he surveyed, and this poll ended up going up to about a thousand people. 60 um, odd percent of them said that they wanted to work in the office um, at 20% of the time. 31%, about 40% of the time. So what you start to see is actually most people want both of those worlds to come together. Um, they don't actually just want to work from home or just work in the office. And so that's kind of good news for us, I think, and good news for the community wellbeing, because I do think we need the physical workplace for that to be a success. And so what I think the office will become is this place where community wellbeing can thrive. It will become a place where employees go to build connections, to maintain face-to-face -face human relationships with people, um, and maybe just to become more human because working from home all the time stops you from having a work life effectively and take it from somebody who knows you have your friends and you have your family, but you don't necessarily build those social connections with your colleagues. And that's really, really important when we'll come on to later on talking about the success of an organization really needs that to happen. And I've been working in HR tech for 20 years as well. And so I've started to realize that Tech is very good at maintaining relationships with people, but it's not as good as replacing for face-to-face. -face. So although myself and Mark met over Twitter, we also met up for a coffee. And so we started to build some face-to-face -face connections. So tech was able to enhance the, the creation of that relationship and is enhancing the maintenance of that relationship, but we still needed that face-to-face -face connection to build some kind of emotional human connection with each other. Uh, and there's a psychologist called Robert Weiss who makes a, quite a big distinction between what he calls social loneliness um, and what he calls a lack of contact with others and emotional loneliness, which can persist regardless of how many connections we have. Um, and when you look at the data in places like uh, throughout the Europe, actually, in all the major cities in Europe, single person households are expected to increase from about 2.1 million in 2011 to around 3.4 million in 2036. So even with more home working, we're set to exacerbate this loneliness and disconnection issue. So employers need to help their people to build meaningful connections at work. And that has to happen face to face in a workplace. And I think if it doesn't, their well-being will suffer. It's vital, I think, that employers consider how their future workplaces are going to enhance connectedness, foster psychological safety, um, build well-being and build communities. And so without designing those employee experience with those things in mind, I don't think employees will be successful uh, as they would be without it. I think employee well-being will fall and the company will suffer. Um, when employers invest in community well-being, the results on the individual are pretty significant. 
when we don't have community well-being, uh, social support harms our health. Um, when we have conversations regularly face to face with colleagues, that benefits our mental and our physical health. Even touching other people, being around other people can help us face challenges better. So being able to hold somebody's hand when you're going through a tough time actually makes you feel like you coped better with that tough time. And so there's all this stuff, this, you know, since humans have been alive on the earth, we know that being around other people, having relationships and having human contact is incredibly important, is vital to our survival. So we don't want to now start forcing people away and moving people to other parts of the world or being distant from each other. When we, we know from you know, hundreds of years worth of research how important human connection is. And when relationships in the workplace are characterized by uh, cooperation, trust, fairness, um, the reward center of the brain is activated, which encourages future interactions that then promotes things like trust and respect and confidence. And employees start to believe the best in each other and they actually become uh, into a position where they start to inspire each other because they started to create some emotional connections. So I think employers really need to think about what matters most and start to make big investments in that. And I do really think that, I already believe this, but I think more and more we're gonna see that work is gonna be what we do and who we do it with, uh, not necessarily a place that we go. Um, and I think that will just evolve over time um, as we move forward through this pandemic and, and, and onwards. And so that means I think the office is going to become this very different place. I think it's going to become a place of gathering and social interaction. I think physical workplaces will be important for preventing that continuation of the growing loneliness epidemic. So I think if we really want to help employees build better lives and better communities and better emotional support and well-being uh, and better social capital, the capital, we have to help them do that. And as employers, we're in a unique position to be able to help employees build that connection. So having those workplaces that are fundamentally designed around how do we make employees well and happy? Because once you can do that with employees, you start to see that actually everything else falls into place and the business succeeds. And there is now a huge amount of, of fast and compelling evidence that if you look after employee well-being, your business will be better off for it. And so I think the the office will become uh, a place of gathering. This is a photograph here of the Benefex offices. You know, we've come to a massive, massive um, uh, redecoration. We've expanded into new space and it's become a really, really nice collaborative workspace. So it's become less like an office and it's almost more like a really funky sixth form college room. It's kind of almost like a university where you have so many breakout places for people to sit and work together and be more collaborative. And so being this, um, as we've gone through this large scale forced experiment in working from home, we've realized the logistics of actually doing that was so much easier than most have expected. But we've also started to realize that there are significant benefits to financial health, mental well-being, relationships and work-life balance. So you all might have heard of employees that because they have, don't have a commute anymore, they've saved money because they've been able to spend more time at home. They've been able to look after their kids for a little bit longer or spend more time with the kids before they get to bed. So there are clear well-being benefits to the home, uh, home working as well as there is to office work or workplace working. But it is clear that employees still need the physical presence of each other to work effectively at least some of the time. So the workplace will become a way of ensuring that employees can maintain and start those connections. I think the office becomes a conscious investment in providing staff with the things that they can't get at home. And I think that's what is going to be uh, a really big point. And somebody's mentioned it in the comments here that um, the idea of a third space. So somebody who works mostly at home and I have an office to go through and I spend a lot of time in London meetings, I'd also go to co-working spaces. And so I found a kind of groove where there are certain types of work that I now do in different spaces that I go to. So. If I'm going to write a report or it's something I really need to get my head down, I'll go to the local coffee shop, I'll put my headphones on and I can kind of concentrate on that and work through it. If I need a quiet space where I'm having lots of phone calls or video calls, I will do that at home. And then when I go into the office, my time is almost exclusively just meeting with other people and having the meetings that I don't think I can have or wouldn't be as successful if I had them via uh, telephone or Zoom. And so I've already been in this place for, for 10 years that I think people are starting to move into. And I think that becomes really important for us to think about the wider impact on society. 
So town centres, places where there's major office buildings, you know, sandwich shops, coffee shops, local shops, all rely on the footfall from those big offices. So we really need to think about the impact that we will have on the wider community, as well as the environment. And we've seen through lockdown, you know, jellyfish in the canals in Venice, dolphins returning to the coast uh, in parts of Italy. And so people are actually starting to see that we have quite a significant opportunity in front of us to help the environment as well. But again, balancing all these things, and I think that word balance is really important. I think the office will become part of our lives, but it will be balanced with home working or remote working. And it's all about giving employees choice. So as soon as um, employees have the choice over where they work, then they can work in whatever way is best for them. And for some of those employees, that will be nine to five in an office with everyone else. And so we're able to just accommodate everybody no matter what's going on in their lives. And as we continue to face this pandemic for, for who knows how long, um, employees will con turn, uh, continue to turn to the most trusted institution in their lives. Um, so in 2020, the Edelman Trust Barometer revealed that for the second year running, employers were the most trusted institution in the lives of glo um, employees globally. So globally, 72% of people say they trust their employer the most. And this measure trust in large institutions like uh, big business, media, government, and out of all of those major, um, major institutions in people's lives, the employer is the most trusted. So all of a sudden, during this pandemic, employees realized that when it came to the crunch, some of their employer wasn't there for them. So you might have seen on social media in your countries that the employers that didn't step up to help their employees, the ones that didn't step up and offer, offer support during the pandemic, um, were kind of blasted on social media. So people have gone onto social media to say how cruel their employers have been or how uncaring their employers have been. Uh, and research that came out during uh, the first two weeks of lockdown showed that 41% of employees say they don't feel like their employer offered enough benefits or programs that supported their well-being during this challenging time. And 77% of employees said that if those benefits were offered, um, it would ease their stress and improve their well-being whilst they're dealing with the pandemic. And if we look at data pre-COVID-19 um, from late um, 2019 and compare that to data from April 2020, April earlier this year, we can see that employees are now more likely to believe their employer has a responsibility to help them with their health and well-being. So that's 73% before, 80% after. So we've seen an almost 10% increase in employees saying they want to now work for an employer that takes care of their well-being. And they feel like their employer has a responsibility of their well-being. So as well as the individual well-being concerns of the individual and the collective, um, an investment in, in community well-being has a positive impact on the organisation too. So in organisations where higher community exists, higher well-being exists. And we, do, we find that because employees work together better and they um, have some really great benefits. And so I wanted to show you some examples of where we've been able to see that. So where we've got case studies that show if an investment in community well-being yields some pretty impressive results for employers. So I first wanted to talk about an experiment called um, the County Durham Experiment. Um, so we all need the health and engagement of our employees at the best of time. But what we start to see with things like employee engagement is that actually you only really notice high employee engagement when you're struggling as an organisation, because that's when you need your employees to come together and work really hard. And so as the world pushes through uh, the pandemic and will push through a recession that follows this pandemic, every organization is going to need their employees to get on board and work really hard so that they can make up for lost time and get the economy and their businesses back on track. And one study by the RSA in the UK, researchers looked at local people in County Durham, uh, an area of the UK, and they were trying to build community capital by strengthening the social network, the connections and networks among single mothers. And they found by strengthening those relationships with single mothers in County Durham, they saw that the use of local health services dropped by 34%. Now, where we have state-funded health service in, in the UK, that 34% drop in just one major city is quite significant. So what we started to see is actually when people felt more connection with other people, when they spent more time and built relationships with other people, they went to the doctor less, which is really significant. And it's significant from anyone, especially listening from the US or any country that has uh, healthcare paid for by the employer because that is such a significant cost and is gonna be a rising cost for years to come. 
And so being able to drop use of those kind of health services is a really, really big win for employers. Um, and we have another example, the Glasgow experiment. Um, in 2014, researchers working on behalf of the Joseph Roundry Foundation in the UK conducted a study called the Livable Lives Study. And this looked at what researchers called low intensity support among three different communities in Glasgow in Scotland. And the study looked at the impact of everyday help within a community. So it looked at the small incremental ways, little bits of help and trust and kindness that people displayed with each other. So it might be somebody popping down the shops and agreeing to get something for their neighbor whilst they were down there, lending them garden tools, whatever it might be, those small little bits of kindness that actually they found develops trust over a period of time. And the participants in these three communities were asked to keep a log of when they gave or received those little bits of help or kindness for one another, and then also give an in-depth account uh, with researchers and interviewers during the time of the experiment. And they found that an individual's need for help led them to become more likely to give help to other people. So if I needed help from one of my neighbors and they supported me, that actually made me significantly more likely to offer help to somebody else. So they found that those small acts of daily kindness and appreciation built strong trust and better relationships with other people. The study found that those small acts of kindness and practical help can in themselves build very deep, emotionally significant um, moments. So for instance, they found offering food to neighbors who are at times of crisis, like a bereavement or suffering the death of a family member. So offering food and those small moments of interactions and care and kindness, they started to see really built strong community. But the researchers also found that the physical setting for where this happened made a big difference. So in those communities, they found that people were congregating in places where they were just passing by each other, in gardens, in stairwells. Um, and the researchers found that there was a strong relationship between the real connection that the physical setting had, which they called in the study narratives of space, and the, um, the emotional part. So it was, wasn't just about the emotional connection people were developing with each other. It was happening in those small fleeting moments of people passing one another or talking over a garden fence or at the bottom of the street. And so again, we can start to think in the workplace that most of what we experience at life and probably what we're missing about the workplace at the moment are those small fleeting moments that we have with people. When you go to make a coffee or get a hot drink and you just have a chat with somebody from a different department or another member of your team, when you pass somebody in a corridor, etc., those moments really matter. So it's really, really um, important that we keep that. And it's really important that when we think about the design of the workplace as we go back to work and as we encourage more remote working, that we allow for that to happen. And we've seen the same with our own product. At Benefix, we have a product uh, and that product is an employee recognition product. And we actually see that as a well-being product because by thanking and rewarding our colleagues for helping us with things, we're building better correct, um, connections with people. We're expressing and receiving gratitude on a regular basis. Uh, and another example we have is uh, the Minnesota experiment in the US, uh, in a small town called Alberta Lee. 18,000 residents were part of a big community well-being experiment. And local shops and restaurants were encouraged to just to use local produce. Uh, individual community members were coached on their purpose and their sense of belonging. And more connectedness with your neighbors was encouraged in the community. And so residents were encouraged to exercise together, to volunteer for local charities and contribute even with meetings in local leaders. So they were invited along to council meetings in those different uh, small towns. And they were asked to give their input on what needed to happen in the community. And the impact of that investment uh, in community wellbeing was pretty significant. So what they found years later is that the average resident increased their life expectancy by three years and key employers in the area saw a reduction in absenteeism by 21% and a decrease in healthcare costs by a massive 40%. So again, really significant cost savings for employers, but it gives us some really important ideas around in the workplace, people need to be involved in decision-making, people need to be recognized, people need to build social connections. And as part of that community well-being, thinking about how are we giving back to the community that we exist in. So are we using local produce in our offices? Are we using local talent and local suppliers and that kind of thing? Because all of that makes a big impact in how people feel about the community that they work on. And possibly one of the biggest experiments, which I'm sure most of you will be familiar with. Community well-being can have a significant impact on team performance. Um, in Google's famous two-year study on team performance, 
they found that the highest performing teams have one thing in common, psychological safety. So the belief that we won't be punished if we make a mistake. Um, and studies show that psychological safety allows for lots of moderate risk taking. We'll be able to speak our mind, have more creativity and innovation. Um, just the type of behavior that leads to real innovation. And there are so many examples in Google of where they've been able to give people the space to do that. They've really enhanced their proposition. But to get to that point, success depends on something else. And that's our kind of our inbuilt systems to build positive emotions, cooperation, confidence, trust, sense of humor, divergent thinking, which you've probably heard a lot of recently. And they all require us to build emotional connections with other people. Um, and so in order to get to those really successful teams, we need people to get to know each other. We need them to get to spend time with each other. Um, we can't do that all virtually and behind a screen all the time. So we need to spend more time with people physically. So employers need to think about ways to facilitate that so that psychological safety can thrive, um, but also facilitate the space for those things to blossom. And so that's why I think it's really important for employers to start considering community well-being as part of their overall well-being strategy. Um, and if you need any more convincing, we have quite a lot of evidence that this is certainly an investment worth making uh, for employers. So what we can see is repeated positive social interactions cultivate greater shared experiences at work and they produce a gradual development of more trusting relationships. And when trust exists between our team members and employees, they are more likely to engage in positive cooperative behavior, which in turn increases employee access to valuable resources. So we see that employees engage in positive social interactions also tend to exhibit more altruistic behaviors by providing coworkers with help. So the same as what we saw in the Glasgow study, when actually you create these environments where people get help and rely on each other, they start to offer more help to each other. And the more help they offer to each other, the better the relationships, the higher the trust, the better the work that they produce because they become more innovative, psychological safety, psychological safety stays high, and those more altruistic behaviors just create a much more caring and accepting workplace. And key findings from a social network analysis of a well-being study of 3,000 people globally found that um, strong connectedness correlates more strongly with well-being than social or economic factors such as long-term illness, unemployment, or being a single parent. And so I'll say that again because I think that's really I think that's really significant. So that was a survey of 3,000 people found that social connections correlated more strongly with well-being than social or economic characteristics, such as long-term illness, unemployment, or being a single parent. We put a lot of effort into making sure that people are physically well, and we have research that suggests the more people are around us and the more caring people we have in our lives, the better our physical health, not just our mental health, the better our physical health. And we can see on the screen here, so when community wellbeing is high, we have lots of evidence to say that there is less home or work conflict. Community well-being directly correlates with job satisfaction. It positively impacts mental health. It positively impacts life satisfaction. More than half of people feel happier when they've got a best friend at work and a quarter feel more productive. So social connectedness is significant. It correlates with mortality. It even correlates more strongly with well-being, as I mentioned, than social economic characteristics. So really, really significant stuff for us to be thinking about. And if we think about the benefits for employers, when community well-being is high within an organization, the evidence shows that individuals share more knowledge, knowledge. So all of a sudden we can see how vital this is for innovation and creativity. Those people who have the knowledge and experience are more likely to share it with their colleagues. We mentioned about loneliness and those people who don't have a close friend at work. Those people who say they do have a close friend at work are seven times more likely to feel engaged. Overall health becomes higher. The more connectedness employees have, the better their individual employee performance. And collaboration is good. So we talk a lot about collaborative workplaces and those companies that promote collaborative working are five times more likely to be high performing and successful businesses. And so I think that leaves us with a really good opportunity. I think it leaves us with an opportunity to create something better than we left when we started lockdown. Important social connections and community well-being don't just exist at work, they exist in our home communities and our families. They exist through friendships and our religion, 
Employees must be given the time and opportunities to spend time with the people they love and the people they care about in work and outside of work. So whether that's through things like flexible working or better annual leave allowances, or even the option to buy or sell holidays so people can either free up some more money to spend with their family or free up some more time to spend with their family. Employees should also think about how they can facilitate time off. Um, so, you know, the development of holidays are really good for people's mental health, time away from work. Um, hobbies and interests and learning and development opportunities, time spent with sports and building connections with friends through sports. All this stuff is really important to how we feel as individuals and how our well-being is kind of cultivated. And so employers need to think about developing a culture of being a safe environment where employees can get to know each other so that they can become comfortable taking risks and making mistakes. mistakes. We need employees to have an open mindset with each other. And employers should also invest in recognition. Our own research shows that employee recognition can combat feelings of loneliness and build more connectedness at work. And that helps to build psychological safety. So as well as just designing our workplaces around giving people the space and opportunity to express gratitude and kindness and build relationships, we can enhance the workplace with some clever technology as well. And it's the marriage of all those things together that I think can create uh, really important uh, developments in health and well-being. As I mentioned at the start, I don't think well-being is a fad. I think we've set a very new expectation in employees' lives that life is difficult and every now and then we're going to need more support. And as the most trusted institution in the lives of our employees, employers are the people that will increasingly be able to help and the institution that is probably most able to support most employees. Employees will continue to gravitate towards those organisations that offer communities and offer supportive communities built around well-being, places where kindness are rife. A global pandemic has highlighted these feelings um, to us of more than we probably realised. We dedicate a huge part of our lives to working for organisations that may never help us when we need it. So my advice to everyone is if you want to create better revenue, more revenue, better innovation, stronger customer loyalty and a better business, I think it's time we started investing in employee well-being, investing in community and building our communities and using the, the, the new marriage of home working and the workplace to do that. Thank you. Yes, and thank you for an uh, excellent presentation and uh, really good to hear about belonging and community. And this is a life lesson, I think, rather than just a work lesson. So thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, quite a few questions coming in and please don't panic if I don't ask your question or don't ask in order I'm kind of being selective so thank you but one that came in just uh, on one of your most recent slides you quoted some data around collaboration what was the source of that collaborative stat uh, we've I've, in the, the note section on the slide deck I've got all the references for the study so if um if anyone wants them we can send them the the full slides and it's got all the references quoted in there so people can read all that original research okay so uh, I was going to share the PDF so I need to share the PowerPoint that's got the notes in as well then yep yes, please yeah I'll, I'll I'll do just that so that that's great Geffen if you want to stop sharing so that we can see a nice big screen of you that would be great thank you um What's your thoughts about the links between happiness and productivity? So I think they're absolutely linked. I think if you think about your own experiences of work, this is a, it's a really good way to think about when you've been most productive uh, as, as a, an individual is when you really felt like you're content at work. So the days where you kind of, you get home and you put your head on the pillow and you go to sleep and you feel like you've actually had a really good productive day. Um, and we only have to look at the mental health and the self-reported happiness of those people who work versus those people who don't. And you can see that work is really good for us. So keeping busy, a sense of achievement, learning, all the stuff that work gives us is really important for our own happiness and mental health. And it's the reason why when people win lotteries and they still go back to their job as a cleaner, because that's a really important part of how they identify and how they remain happy in life. So I think that the two are absolutely linked. I think it's very hard to get strong or good quality and high productivity if if employees aren't happy or at least content in their work great thank you uh there was a, a quote a stat that you said that uh, um, was talking about productivity reducing for home workers 
Whereas there's a question from, from Aidan saying, there's research that says a majority of homework employees have actually increased productivity. So where was your research for that from? Yeah, so there's um, there's quite a lot has come out of the last four months. And if you look at some, and again, we've got the, the references in the slide deck, but you can start to see that employee productivity for those people who work from home peaks whilst this is kind of new to them. So it kind of peaks, people kind of get into a groove and people tend to overcompensate. So what we saw, what we saw in the UK and the US in particular at the start of lockdown is people overcompensated because they felt like they weren't in the workplace. They weren't being seen by their manager. People put more effort in. So people actually worked a bit harder than they would if they were in the office, but they also lack the distractions. So generally speaking, the evidence shows that people in the long term produce better results when working from home if that works for them because there'll clearly be some employees that just don't like working from home or don't have um, a safe environment to do so or don't have the space so what we've seen through lockdown is we saw a big spike in people who'd never worked from home before being really productive and as we've got used to this we have started to see that drip now what will happen is that will level off over a period of time so people never went back to the office or continued to work this way most people who'd never worked from home will now start to see some kind of leveling off and it's just about how you get into the groove of, you know, what works for you and all that kind of stuff. But generally speaking, I agree, people are more productive at home, but there are groups of people who um, just like the workplace, who need other people around them, who need to be able to just turn to somebody for support. Uh, my partner is one of those people, hates working from home, whereas I obviously love it. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, how do you define psychological safety and are there, what would be your three ways to encourage it? Yeah, it's a great question. So there are quite a few different definitions out there. Um, I put one in my book and somebody argued with it. Somebody sent me a message saying they didn't think it was their definition, but I use the definition from the British Psychological Society. Um, but it's, if you look at the, um, the big Google study, that was a, called Project Aristotle. So if you Google, you can read the Wikipedia page on Project Aristotle and it tells you all about it. Uh, and that pretty much matches mine. But it's basically the idea that Employees aren't um, experimental, they aren't creative, they aren't more, they aren't innovative if they can't feel like they can give ideas. Because obviously when you sit in a group of people and you're giving your idea or your opinion, you're leaving yourself wide open to be criticized. And so the psychological safety is creating an environment where it's safe for people to speak up and, and speak their mind, and they're not gonna be made to feel like a fool or an idiot for doing so. And again, it's just having those people around you and those people in your team that encourage you to speak up even if you've got a rubbish idea you won't be judged for that and if you look at how google um if kind of some of the stuff that google people like google have produced because they allowed employees to speak up it's quite significant um and i remember when i worked in financial services i was responsible for our internal innovation scheme which was employees could basically anonymously send us ideas if they wanted to on how we could improve things and then if they wanted to give us their name and we, we put that thing in place, we would give them a kind of reward, which is usually kind of a, a gift voucher. Um, and we had some really, really basic ideas that felt stupid on the, uh, the first glance, but actually saved us a lot of money. And one of those was we sent applications out to customers and we didn't print those applications double-sided. And somebody sent us this message and said, why don't we print them double-sided? We'll save one sheet of paper for every application we send out. And it ended up saving the business £40,000 a year, about $60,000, just because of a really basic idea. Now, if we created an environment where somebody thought, I'm not going to say that because that seems pretty obvious, somebody must have said that before, then we would never have uh, let that little thing improve our business. So I think it's really important that we create those environments where people can just speak up and have ideas, no matter how silly they might seem. Okay, thank you. Uh, what about the physical workplace? I don't know if you want to answer this. How do we stay social when we have to keep a physical distance when we're in the office? Yeah, so it's a, it's a great point. Um, we, in some of those areas where you've locked down, you, you've kind of been able to probably now start meeting up with your kind of parents and some of your friends and a limited number of households. Um, so I think you just need to be in the presence of other people. I think you know, keeping one or two meters away from them um, you know, long term, we will start to see the impact of us not having those close physical relationships with people. So if we look at some of the research that came out post SARS in parts of Asia in 2008, 2009, the effect that lockdown has on people and the effect that long term disconnect from people has 
um, people display symptoms of PTSD, post-traumatic stress. And we've started to see that already. So the Lancet, which is a, a big global scientific journal, has produced some research recently to say that when people go through lockdown, they start to display post-traumatic stress. And it's anticipated that we will have a kind of a next wave of coronavirus over the next couple of years, which will be a rise in mental health issues. Um, in the UK, we've seen about 10% of people who've never had a mental health issue before have had one since lockdown. So it's having a big effect on us. And so I think just being able to get closer to people, even if it's limited to kind of one meter or two meter, if there's a screen between you, it's about just having the physical presence of other people that makes us feel good about ourselves and helps us. Thank you. Some companies want to implement employee well-being initiatives, but don't seem to want to spend the budget towards these initiatives or have limited budget. What do you, would you say to these companies? Probably the question I face most is, how do we spend money on this thing? And I think we really need to start thinking about employee well-being as an investment, not a cost. So there is now a huge amount of evidence, and I could probably send you know 50 global studies that prove if you invest X amount of pounds or dollars, you will get X amount back. Um, and there's a really big Deloitte report that came out of the UK uh, just a couple of months ago that shows largely for every kind of, and I think I put it in the presentation, for every kind of five euros, five dollars or five pounds, you, sorry, for every one dollar, one euro or five pounds, uh, one, sorry, one dollar, one euro uh, or one pound invest, you'll get five back. So we've kind of got this times five multiplication. And like I say, that evidence is really, really compelling. So I think, you know, where most of my time is spent at the moment is making, helping our customers build that return on investment. So when they go internally and ask for that money, we can show them that in 12 years, 24 months, um, 12 months, 24 months, 48 months, this is how you're going to make that money back through improved loyalty, reduced absent, increased productivity. And so like I say, there's a lot of compelling evidence now. So I think my advice is, the research is out there, create a really compelling business case that's based on evidence because we've been able to do that with our customers and it becomes really, really difficult for somebody to not spend the money when you make that really compelling argument with lots of evidence in. Gethin, uh, five to the hour. So I think I would like to say a great big thank you for your input and insights there. That's been really, really good. Just to remind everyone, we do have other events and the link is in the chat box. Uh, but also to say, Gethin has been really generous to share his slide deck, and I will make sure that's available with you all. That'll be in a follow-up email that will be with you probably tomorrow. Uh, but also uh, in the recording, Gethin's happy to make available as well. So I will upload that to a YouTube channel if you're okay with that, Gethin, as well. Yeah, absolutely. And if anyone wants to kind of carry on talking to me about this, they can email me, gethinaden at hellobenefex.com. Um, if you or I'm on Twitter at World of Good World of Good Book or at uh, Hello Benefex, uh, we'd love to kind of continue the discussion with you. And if you have any questions about the research, we can kind of follow up that with you as well. Yeah, and I would check out the podcast as well, worth. And we'll follow up some of those links uh, afterwards. Uh, really great one with a guy called Catch Love. I thought that was pretty good. So <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, a little break before your next meeting or lunch. Uh, so thank you very much. And Gethin, really big thank you, uh, everyone. Uh, Thanks, and I, I always like you to stay on just for a little while to wave goodbye to everyone because it yeah. seems to be, yeah, it seems to be the way that, that, that yeah. happens now. Very odd. Thank you very much, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.